And joining me now to discuss in further depth the future of space exploration is Phil Smith, senior space analyst at the Tory Group. Hi there. Um, thank you so much for joining us. People are very, they were very upset at President Obama when he actually decided to end that space program, uh, the shuttle program that is. It cost people jobs after all. But could it be argued that this was just a kick in the bum for the private industry and, and, and that's exactly what they needed to get going? That's a, absolutely right, Megan. Thanks for having me on. Uh, NASA has invested uh, a, a fair sum on commercial uh, cargo services, for instance, to the International Space Station with the belief that uh, doing so will save the taxpayers uh, money. But that effort uh, through SpaceX, for example, and Orbital Sciences Corporation, yeah, these companies uh, employ people to do that kind of work. Uh, and as we see this year, uh, both companies have started uh, to launch their rockets uh, toward the ISS. So there is definitely a lot going on, and there's also development on the crew side as well, and we expect those flights to begin around 2016 or so. Now, whenever scientists have explored places like the rainforest, for instance, they found a lot of room for profit in medicines um, and, and other developments that they've come upon. Is space the next big place for even bigger discoveries and huge profits? I mean, you're saying it's saving money, but uh, could the government have even come in and taken some of this money? Well, to give you a sense of the size of the space industry worldwide, it's about $290 billion. Uh, that includes government uh, budgets as well as commercial revenues. Uh, to give a sense of scale, the telecommunications industry is about $4 trillion. Um, so the space industry is large, but in the context of other industries, uh, such as telecom, it's, it's fairly small. Um, of that, $170 billion is uh, dedicated to satellite telecommunications, mostly direct uh, to home TV and broadcast television. So. Uh, a lot of people do think that uh, there's some money to be made in space, uh, and certainly satellite services have proved that. What we're seeing now is the industry is shifting toward uh, uh, making money on uh, cargo transportation, uh, crew transportation, and uh, those might enable further uh, 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 markets to develop, including, for example, resource extraction and processing. Sure, and we actually uh, have a statistic that says that Planetary Resources, that's uh, one of these private space groups, thinks that the, this asteroid mining could actually be a multi-trillion dollar industry uh, in the future. But let me ask you, a lot of people, when they think of private space companies, they think about launching people into space. Now, what is the point of this, and is it just kind of a way for them to pay for more serious missions? Uh, in a way, it, it is. Uh, for instance, uh, as we heard earlier, the Spaceship Two flight, uh, the first supersonic flight using a rocket like that that's licensed by, for example, the FAA uh, here in the United States, uh, the idea is to start to uh, um, address the, the demand that's uh, out there for people. As you see, about 575 tickets already pre-sold. Um, but the idea behind the development of these vehicles, which are suborbital, so they only go up to about 110 kilometers, and the period people that go up on there experience about five minutes of weightlessness. But the idea is to uh, develop experience uh, turning around these vehicles quickly um, and launching them frequently each day. And that informs how to develop uh, more capable vehicles that could uh, reach orbital uh, uh, velocities, for instance. Uh, and then those, in turn, could enable uh, those markets I indicated earlier in terms of crew cargo transport to the moon, for instance, and near-Earth asteroids. The resources that would be extracted up there in part would serve people on the ground here, but are also understood to help uh, establish people who would start to settle in space, uh, like on the moon and so forth. And as you said, obviously these private industries are learning a lot uh, from these launches into suborbital space. And also NASA is potentially learning a lot. I know that NASA said last week that it would reward up to $125,000 to accurate astronautics for a uh, software system that would actually allow a spacecraft to maneuver autonomously um, in close proximity to near-Earth asteroids. So it's not only uh, going into private industry, this is also going back into NASA, right? The finding that these places are finding? Oh, that's absolutely right. In fact, that's a very good point you bring up. Uh, NASA's role is to explore. Uh, they do a lot of the high-cost, high-risk high uh, activity. And then the commercial you could think of is kind of doing the backfill. So, for instance, the commercial side of things is focusing in terms of orbital flight 
uh, in launching satellites, of course, but also servicing the International Space Station, which is about 350 kilometers above our heads. NASA is going further. Uh, they're developing the Space Launch System, a very large rocket that rivals that that was used to send uh, humans to the moon. Uh, that vehicle will come online around 2018 to 2020. That vehicle will send cargo and, and people uh, beyond uh, low Earth orbit. Um, so, so there's a lot of exciting things happening out there. Uh, there's also a lot of commercial flights that occur out of Russia, uh, as well as the uh, Europe. Um, so there's, there's quite a bit of activity, quite a bit of activity and a lot of jobs as a result of that. Well, it is quite an uh, interesting and exciting time for the space industry, both private and commercial. Phil Smith, he's a senior space analyst at the Tory Group. Thank you for uh, your research and your input. Thank you, Megan.